there's a highway that runs up the coast, the west side, the Gulf of Mexico side of Florida. It goes through Tarpon Springs and on down and around. It's called Highway 19. Awful traffic, terrible traffic. Lights every 100 feet. It's really bad. We lived there for about almost two years, Elizabeth and I, when we first married. Uh, I was preaching at the Tarpon Springs uh, Church of Christ. And I remember there was a, a sign for one of the community churches, great big community church, had, I don't know, 1,000, 2,000 people. And one of the slogans or advertisements that they had on this sign, trying to appeal to people to help them to uh, encourage them to come attend with them, was a question on this billboard. It said, what can faith do for you? And it had a picture of a husband and a wife, and it had a picture of a job, it had a picture of children, it had these different elements of our lives. Rather than having something even remotely depicting something spiritual, forgiveness of sins, a home in heaven, it was all about the physical and what that church was claiming it could do to help you have a better life in this world. And I've never forgotten that uh, billboard. I've incorporated it into sermons before. I think I've mentioned it here before. But it's applicable in the lesson that we're going to talk about this morning because it shows a mindset that not only some people have in attending a church, but also even in what some churches are trying to present themselves uh, to, to, to lure people in, to try to bring people to come and attend with them. And it's all about what can the church do for you? How can the church help you? As if the responsibility is entirely on the church and the only thing that we want from you is to come and show up, come as you are. And we'll try and help you in your marriage. We'll try to help you in your family life. We'll try to help you in your job. We'll try to help you have a better physical life. I want you to imagine if that mindset permeated the Church of Christ. If the mindset was, when I get up in the morning on Sunday morning, and I come to class, and I come to worship two times on Sunday, and I come to uh, services on Wednesday night, if my mindset in coming was only for everybody else to serve me. Because keep in mind, the church, it's the body, it's the people, it's not the building, and it's not the quote-unquote leaders of that church, it's all of us. So when I come to worship, when I come to Bible class, when I attend with the saints, I'm not really interested in putting any effort into helping anyone else. My focus is what I can get out of it and take with me to help me. So this morning, I'd like to consider the question of what is my responsibility as a member of the Lord's body? When I consider the fact that I, being baptized, am now a Christian, and I identify myself with a local work, that's what we call placing membership, that phrase itself is not a scriptural phrase, however, we see it in practice throughout the New Testament. Paul himself, it seems, considered himself a member of the church at Antioch at Syria. He always ended up going back there. Of course, many of his missionary journeys, they started from Antioch of Syria. The elders there were the ones that set him and Barnabas to the task uh, by the direction of the Holy Spirit to teach the gospel in those places that he went. When we think about being a part of a local work, especially broad, on a broad scheme, it's, it's, the, it's the body of Christ. But a local work of that body, a local congregation, what, is, what should be my responsibility? Or do I have any responsibility? Should we be actively presenting ourselves not only to each other as a church, but also to any visitors that may come, that what can faith do for you? How can we help you in your physical life? And you don't have to worry about doing a single thing. There is no responsibility on you other than to take and then to apply in your physical life to have a better life. Think about the term responsibility. In fact, I heard a, a great lesson one time on responsibility, and the, the preacher mentioned that it, it, it's two words in one, response and ability. 
He said a good way to remember what responsibility means or how to define responsibility is it is my response based on my ability to respond. It's how I respond in a given situation where I am, uh, it is important for me to respond. Well, what is my ability in that situation to respond to whatever the situation is? It's having capacity to be held accountable to a duty, an obligation, or a burden. Of course, certainly serving as a Christian is not a burden, but it is a duty. It is an obligation that we have. So when we think about church membership then, or my identifying with a local work of God's people, this can be defined as my responsibility as a Christian to the work of the Lord in my location. We have the, the broad body of Christ that is made up of many congregations of God's people across the world. When I am in a location and I worship with the saints as I am commanded to do, I need to identify myself with those saints. And unfortunately, what we have sometimes, though, is uh, brethren who sometimes prefer to be in limbo. And, and I can understand that if it's a, a temporary assignment for a couple of months, maybe I'm only going to be here for a little bit. Maybe I'm just visiting. Certainly, you don't pl place membership every time you go on a trip. But for an amount of time in which I'm going to be located in a certain position, some certain place, and there's a body of Christ there, it's important that I identify myself with those brethren. Not only for my sake, because notice it's being held accountable to a duty and obligation. Being placing membership somewhere means that I'm submitting myself to oversight. In the absence of elders, that oversight is kind of held by, by all of us. We all help to try to keep each other and to encourage each other and to make sure we're all remaining faithful. But the idea of submitting myself to that oversight and being willing to put myself in that position, to be held accountable, to worship with the saints, to study God's word, to make sure I'm practicing what God has for me to do. And in addition to that, on the flip side, it's also important for the saints so that they know where you are. They know where you stand. They know that you're serving faithfully or perhaps now they have a reason to, to think or to believe that maybe you're not. We need to help him. We need to, to reach out to him. So then when it comes to the concept of responsibility, of my being part of the body of Christ in a local work, what does the Bible say? that I should be taking to myself as a responsibility. Rather than leaving my home in the morning on Sunday, or leaving work, or, or leaving home on Wednesday nights to come to worship, and thinking that it's all about what I can take in from it, what can I put into it? Instead of just, it's, it's what faith and what the church can do for me, what can I do to help? Well, here's one thing that the Bible's very clear on. We need to make sure, every one of us has an obligation, we have a duty to make sure that the truth of God's word is being taught and that that truth is being practiced. It's not unheard of for faithful churches to have preachers and elders and deacons all fall away together into a thought and then for an entire body follow along with them into doing something that is not according to Scripture. That's not unheard of. It's happened. If you, if you doubt that, look at Oak Hills in San Antonio. They used to be a faithful church that belonged to Christ. And now for many decades, they haven't been. Because the preacher and the elders decided, you know what, we're going to change the way we do things. It's important for every one of us to make sure that the truth is being taught and that it's being practiced. But that requires us to learn both on an individual basis, on our own time, but also making sure we're here to learn as well as to make sure that what's being taught and practiced is according to truth. But that, that, that requires me to want to be here to make sure that I'm taking in what's being taught and what's being done. In Acts chapter 17 and in verse 11, the Bereans were more fair-minded than the ones that Paul had encountered and as a result, notice as Paul is teaching them the truth, they are looking at the scriptures daily 
to determine if the things that Paul was teaching were accurate to the prophecies and the words of the Old Testament. As a result, what, it, what would have happened if one of the Bereans simply decided, you know what, I'm not really a part of this synagogue here. Uh, I'm just here for a year and a half or so. I'm not really going to, to talk to them. I'm not going to go. I'm going to do my own thing. And they completely miss out on the teaching of the gospel. They learn, perhaps, that they shouldn't be looking, or, or they don't learn, that they shouldn't be looking for a physical Messiah, but they need to be looking for the spiritual Messiah. They miss that because they weren't there. They weren't there to hear it taught. It's important for us to understand this is one of our responsibilities that isn't just on the preacher, not just on elders if we have them, or deacons. It's not just on the men of the church. It's on all of us to make sure that the teaching of the Lord is being taught properly and it's being practiced properly. And by doing so, we help, there's, a, there's kind of checks and balances that take place. Because it helps us to make sure that as a congregation, we're adhering to the New Testament example. Just like in Acts chapter 2 and in verse 42, when the, after the day of Pentecost, the church that then existed in Jerusalem, the saints that were being taught, they held fast to the apostles' teaching to the example that they established, to the breaking of bread, which is the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. They took what, and remember, Jesus himself gave it to the apostles in the, what we call the Great Commission. You teach them to observe all things that I've commanded you. So from, the, from Jesus, it went to the apostles. From the apostles, it went to the brethren in Jerusalem who were converted on the day of Pentecost. And they held fast to that. But we need to make sure that everything we teach and everything we practice is according to the truth. That involves making sure we align ourselves with what the Bible teaches on uh, discipline. When we have a brother or a sister in Christ who's not paying attention to what they should do, they're no longer serving in the capacity that they should as a brother or sister in Christ, as a faithful servant. There are steps that as a congregation of God's people, we aren't just, it's not just suggested that we follow, we are commanded to follow. The proper use of making sure the Lord's money is used the way that, that the New Testament describes. The, the way in which we worship, that which we have in worship or singing, or in many cases that which people want to include in worship that we don't find in Scripture. All of this, it's on us to make sure that we take on these roles. And it's very important in doing so that we don't confuse man's traditions with God's commands. And this is just as important in the church that belongs to Christ as any other professed faith or, or gospel or teaching out there. In Matthew chapter 15 and in verse 9, Jesus quotes Isaiah in condemning the Jews. He says, well, did Isaiah say of you? And then in verse 9, he says this concept of in vain do they worship me teaching as uh, teaching the, the, the uh, commandments of men as if there was the doctrine of God. Teaching a, <laughs> hold on, I want to I, I get the quote right. In vain do they worship me, teaching as uh, commandments of God, the, the traditions of men. In, in Matthew chapter 15 and in verse 9, as Jesus is speaking to them, in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctors the commandments of men. I don't, I don't know why it was so hard for me to remember that. That idea, that concept, though, is very prevalent today. The idea of what has been done for so long, okay, that, that which has been part of our routine for so long, that it has become, in many people's minds, part of Scripture. There was a time, not too long ago, where, and there are still some places today, some churches today, still have a sheet on top of the Lord's Supper table. And then when it comes time for the Lord's Supper, the sheet is taken off, the Lord's Supper is served, and the sheet is put back on. That's new to me. I never had that growing up. But there are places that still do that. And for a lot of younger people, they have no idea that this is just a tradition. And some, sometimes young people will ask, well, why, why do we do this? And some of the younger generation people, 30s and 40s years old, they don't know either. In fact, I know of one specific example where they ended up going to an 85-year-old man because nobody could remember where this started or why they did it. They couldn't find it in Scripture. 
And the 85-year-old just laughed. He said it was back when we didn't have air conditioning, and it was meant to keep the flies off of the bread and the fruit of the vine. But you see, it got incorporated so much into the routine and the mind of the brethren, it almost became a scriptural issue. Well, let's not have the sheet on there. Oh, no, no, we can't do that. We, we can't have, not have the sheet on there. It has to be on there. We have to be very careful. Having traditions is fine. These are things that are incorporated in part of, of how we do things and what we do. Like, for instance, our order of services. We have a song. We have a prayer. We have a song. We have the Lord's Supper. We have a song. We have contribution. The congregation across town where I grew up had the Lord's Supper and the contribution at the end, after the lesson and the invitation. They always had it at the end of service, kind of like what we do on Sunday afternoons. But that's when they always had it. Didn't matter if it was Sunday morning, Sunday night. That was weird to me. I said, like, this, is, this can't be scriptural. Of course, I was a kid. I didn't know any better. But it was completely different from what I was used to. Now I know better. It doesn't matter. As long as it's done in the process of that service, it could be at the very beginning before you even sing a song. That'd be a little different, wouldn't it? And one of these days, when we have a lesson on the Lord's Supper specifically, we're going to have on a Sunday morning the Lord's Supper after the lesson just to kind of help us really think about what it is we're doing. And, well, of course, that'll be something we announce ahead of time, let everybody know. But we have to be very careful not to let traditions become commandments in our mind to make things scriptural issues that, in fact, are not, if they aren't. Another responsibility that we have as members of a local work is to see to the needs of the saints. This can happen certainly on a congregational level, okay, but per individually, on a personal level, on a one-on-one -on -one level. Sometimes you may be aware of a need that a brother or sister has because they confide in you, but they don't want everybody else to know. It's just something personal, it's something private, it's something said in confidence, and maybe you're in a position to help that brother or that sister. But if I go into having a, a local work as a place where I'm, I'm going to worship, and I think that it's all about what I can get out of it, then I'm not going to be concerned about the needs of others. When the Hebrew writer tells us in Hebrews chapter 10 and in verse 24, as we consider in a text in which the Hebrew writer is calling on these brethren, let us draw near. Let us come with full assurance of faith, he says. He also says, let us consider one another to stir up love and good works. But that requires for us, first of all, to be with the brethren. Whether that's Bible class, worship service, opportunities to get together with them or speak to them or, or communicate with them outside of service. I, notice what that scripture says. Consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. That term consider means to meditate deeply on. The idea is that when I'm preparing to spend time with my brethren, whether it's in service or out of service, I need to be thinking about, now what can I do to help so-and-so who I know is going through a hard time? To encourage, to edify, what can I do to put my efforts forward to stir up within my brethren the idea of this love that we have binding us together. What can I do to promote good works? That the Hebrew writer is commanding not that we stir up love and good works, not just that, but that we think ahead of time about how to do it. That takes a premeditated effort that's an obligation. That is a duty that we have as being part of a local work. In the passage that Ben read a little while ago in 1 John chapter 3, John talks about how we know if we love the brethren. He uses the example of a brother who has means, and then he encounters this brother who is lacking the world's goods. He's lacking food. He's lacking clothing. Well, you wouldn't, you wouldn't not help him, okay? Well then he compares that to we also ought to lay down our lives. This is how we ought to do. We ought to be willing to die for the brethren. James says something very similar in James chapter 2, using it as an example of faith without works. But what John says is, as he concludes it there, he says, let us not love in, de or in the word and in tongue, but in deed and in truth. 
in deed and in truth. Basically, what he's saying is your actions will speak louder than words. And the whole point of that is John, he offers no middle ground here. You either love the brethren or you hate your brother. There's no middle ground there. And he likens one who hates his brother, which is to say, I don't care about my brother's needs. I don't care what's going on with my brother. All I care about is me and what faith can do for me, what the brethren can do for me. He who hates his brother, John likens him to a murderer. No different. You either love your brother or you hate your brother. Either you're concerned about your brother's welfare or you're only concerned with your own. In 1 Corinthians 13, notice the phrases that Paul used in a chapter that is all about the definition of what love is. Notice how Paul, he brings out love, love does not envy. Love does not. There is this comparison, and really it's a contrast. Here's what love does, and here's what love does not do. There is no overlap. There is no gray area in these definitions of love. Love is kind. Love is gentle. Love does not puff up. Love does not envy. Love does not seek its own. And it's important for us to remember that one of our duties as a Christian at a local work is not simply to tell ourselves that we love our brethren, or necessarily to limit it just to telling our brethren that we love them, but to actually show it in how we act with them, and how we interact, and how we uh, go about helping to stir up love and good works, to encourage and to edify. That is one of the responsibilities that we have that is included in church, what we call church membership, or the local work. But in order to bear one another's burdens is part of that encouragement, knowing that there's someone who's discouraged, that's going through a rough time, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2, uh, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. In order to do that, I need to care about that person. Not just, hey, I'm seeking to unload my burden on every person I see, and I'm not, I don't want to help you. You're just going to help me. Okay, I... You, you're my friend. I'm not your friend. I've heard, I've heard that, that expression used before uh, on a TV show to show the idea that, that I expect you to help me. It's not about me helping you. You're my friend. I'm not your friend. Well, that's not the way this works. Brethren in Christ care about one another. That's one of our responsibilities. It's a blessing, but it is a, it is a responsibility. We trust one another enough to be able to share our burdens with each other. It requires me to know about that burden, to know about that struggle for me to help you. But that all requires an equal amount on both sides of the line here. Whether it's an individual or as a congregation, we're all aware of someone who's in need. It requires us to give, not just take. But the beauty of this is if all of us are shouldering each other's burdens, if I'm sharing my burden with you and you're sharing your burden with me, guess what? We're still all carrying burdens, aren't we? But we're all doing it together. And that's the beauty of it. We're not alone. And that's one of the things that the devil always wants us to try to think we are, that you're alone. No one cares about you. No one wants to help you. No one's concerned about you. Man, if the devil can get us there, he can get us into the depths of discouragement. But to know that my brethren care, to know that they're helping me to shoulder this burden, and then to know that, you know what, I'm, this, my burden's been lifted a bit. I can help someone else too. And then together we go to heaven. That's a very active part of that we get to heaven together. The last thing on biblical responsibility, as the, the scriptures teach us and tell us, is to actually put forth the work. That's the labor part. That's the energy part in the work, which is the noun form, the idea of what we do in the work of the Lord. The actual laboring in the vineyard 
of that which is given to us to do to be faithful to God. In Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 10, Paul, on several occasions throughout Galatians, but in Galatians 6, he reminds the brethren in Galatia, do not grow weary in doing good. And then he offers up that which we sow, we will also reap. If we sow to corruption, we will reap corruption. But if we sow to the Spirit, we will reap of the Spirit. In Revelation 14 and in verse 13, the Spirit says, and John writes down, that blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, blessed are they, for they rest from their labor and their works follow them. Their works that justify them as being servants of God, of their labor in the faith, it follows them. They labored all the way even unto death, and now they can rest. We need to remind ourselves that when we talk about the work of the Lord, it is our work. It is not the preacher's work. It is not the elder's work. It's not so-and-so's work. It's our work. We are working together in the vineyard of the Lord. Our bulletin article this morning is, is called Indulge Me. And it's about indulgences that were offered back in medieval times by the Catholic Church. And the whole concept, and I won't go into a long uh, dissertation on indulgences, but what it boiled down to was the idea that I can spend money and in place of me actually doing good work, someone else is going to do them for me. That's what basically indulgences were. In order to pay the physical burden for having sinned, which is at the Catholic Church, there's the spiritual aspect of it that only God can forgive, but then there's the physical need to reimburse God, for instance, basically is the idea. That there's some kind of physical penance that must be paid. Well, instead of you doing those good works to make up for your sin, you give us money, buy an indulgence, and we will do those good works in your name. And so they'll get registered to your account. Brethren, I have experienced at times faithful Christians who have this mindset about preachers. That's what we pay the preacher to do. We don't have to do that because that's what his job is. We pay him so we don't have to. And the same can carry over even to elders. That's what they do so that we don't have to think about it. So that we don't have to deal with it. It's important for us to understand that we cannot buy indulgences. We cannot seek to put the responsibility of good works on someone else. That's not how it works. We have to seek the work of the Lord and do it on our own. That requires communication. As a congregation of God's people, when we reach out to our community, our gospel meeting, for instance, also on an individual basis, it requires communicating with others. It requires premeditation, thinking about how I'm going to go about reaching my neighbor, reaching my coworker, reaching my classmate. But this is my work. This is our work. This is not ever someone else's work. And that's a very important aspect to our responsibility of being in a local work of God's people. So having said all of that, how can we apply some of this? Well, think about the passage in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and in verse 12, where Paul tells Timothy, let no one despise your youth, but be an example, and depending on which version you have, King James, New King James, of or to the brethren. And then he lists all these different ways, aspects, in which Timothy is to be an example, in word, in faith, in doctrine. Well, you know what? Both are true. We are to be an example to and of the brethren. One is to one another. Well, certainly that's carried about in Scripture. We should be good examples to each other. But the other is being an example of faithful people in the world. Certainly that also, letting our light shine, is part of what we're taught to be. So it doesn't matter whether it's to or of, we are to be an example regardless. And notice all these ways in which Paul tells Timothy to be an example in faith, in love, in doctrine, it's teaching. 
apply that in my life by actually saying, I'm going to make sure that I don't, especially don't attach myself to things that are sinful, to give myself as if I'm uh, pretending to go along with some of these things because I just don't want to stand out. and I don't want to cause a fuss. I don't want to make anybody up, upset at me. So I'm just going to kind of go along with the flow. And when it comes to us as a congregation of God's people, and for that matter, the Bible in general, we need to make sure we're always willing to look at Scripture. Sometimes we have a tendency to, the temptation is there, to have a tendency to condemn others for being closed-minded. But what if we were on the other side of that? I firmly believe everything that we do, we've done today, and that we do every, every service that we come together, we are following the example of Christ. But suppose for a moment that someone were to come to us and they were to question something that we do or that we approve of or that we teach, and they say that where's your example, whether it's express example, that is express command, or implied example. Where, where is it here? Sometimes, if we don't know how to answer people, our first instinct is to become defensive and argumentative, to become angry. We see that a lot, sometimes, on the other side of things, when we ask that question of other people. But remember what the Bereans did? They were more fair-minded. They were willing to search out the scriptures before they even came to a conclusion about what Paul said. They decided to go to God's word first. We need to make sure we have that mindset as well. We should never be afraid to ask, you know what, I want to make sure we have authority for this or for that. Make sure that we're doing what God wants us to do. That's not a, that shouldn't be a danger to me. That shouldn't be a threat to me. I should be willing to tackle that head on and say, you know what, if there's something that I'm doing that doesn't have the authority of God behind it, then I really need to think about what it is I'm doing because that's what we claim to do is to have the authority of Christ in everything that we do. We also need to make sure that we consider how I can help teach others, whether it's by example, whether it's by offering maybe, you know, I, one of the things that I, I love about many of the things our brethren here do is in the emails that we send out, sometimes there's scriptures attached to them, there's reminders for who to pray for, there's updates about people who are in need of encouragement, this is something that's important for us to be able to maintain communication even when we're not here at services together. We can still remind each other that we're part of a, of a body of Christ. We're part of a family. And encouraging each other to help, whether it's a brother or sister in Christ or even my neighbor down the road, to put my best foot forward in being an example of someone who's benevolent and loving and cares about others, even if I don't agree with their with their lifestyle or agree with their, what they believe, I'm still willing to do what I can to help and to be an example and hopefully maybe that'll lead to a Bible study. Maybe it'll lead to a discussion. When it comes to the brethren, you know a lot of times we have brethren who aren't here for multitude of different reasons. We have a lot of shut-in. We have a lot of people who live a distance away. Some drive an hour to, to come to worship. And so sometimes it's difficult for them. It's a, it's a strain on gas. It's a strain on, on health for people to get out. But you know what? Just to let them know, hey, I missed you. Hey, I noticed you weren't here today. And I was just wondering if everything's okay. You know, that means the world to people. It does. And especially if it's someone who has a tendency to maybe not get out more than they do because of their health, maybe it's because of their age, just to know that they're not forgotten to know that people are thinking about them and people are, are worried about them and care about them, that means the world. We need to make sure we seek out brethren beyond the worship services to get to know them. That's not necessarily just at, at opportunities that we gather together as a group of people somewhere, just to kind of get together and to have a meal together, but even on an individual basis, sitting down and having a cup of coffee, sitting down and having a, a cup of tea, having a meal together. Just that opportunity to get to know one another, to be able to learn about a person's history, gives you great insight into how that person thinks and what their attitude on certain things is. And it helps in future communications. It helps in future dealings. 
That's a very important aspect for us to be able to do. And kind of on the aside of that is not to, not to give into temptation to have these little cliques that sometimes tend to form. In any congregation, you're going to have people who naturally gravitate towards either people of the same uh, age, same gender sometimes. Maybe it's the same uh, situation in life with children or whatnot because of shared experiences. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But you know what can happen, and what has happened at places before in the past that I've heard of, is sometimes these brethren will never ever spend time with anyone else except these people. They'll never talk to anybody else except these people. And so what it boils down to is you have these factions within the body, that local work, that I don't really care about anybody else except these people. That's a clique. That's, that, those are people who shut out everybody else except those that they're most compatible with. And we can't allow that to happen. We have to make sure that we love all of the brethren, that we seek to help all of the brethren, that we pray for one another. You know, prayer is a powerful, powerful tool that we have, that God has given us. And to know that somebody's praying for me is a huge benefit. It is a huge encouragement. Whether we tell them that we're praying for them or not, to know that we're praying for them, that God will take care of them, that His will will be what He wants it to be, you know, that, that is a huge, important aspect of our spiritual life, or at least I hope it is. I hope it is. It, it should be. Those people we have on our prayer list, I, I hope it's not just something we pass over because they're always sometimes, I mean, we have the same people that are going through health, health issues a lot of times, that we don't just pass it over, oh, it's all kind of one and the same thing. And just during the week, I forget about them until it comes announcement time again. We use the, as a tool to remind ourselves to mention some of these individuals in our prayers. Maybe one night I mention two or three individuals, the next night maybe I mention some others. However I do it, I want to mention these individuals in prayer. And all of this leads us to, and these are just ways to encourage and to edify. Because that's what Paul says in Ephesians 4, the body of Christ is supposed to do. It encourages itself, it builds itself, it grows, by which each joint supplies. Each point does its share. And so we're supposed to make sure that we take care of one another. Regarding the work, be active and participate when the opportunities present themselves. I know sometimes, especially when it comes to individuals who maybe are a little bit older or our health is, is waning, maybe we feel like we can't be productive. Maybe we feel like we can't really do anything to help. But you know what? There's always something. This isn't just be active and participate. It's not limited to public service, fellas. Ladies, we're sitting in our pews. Sometimes maybe we feel like we're not active and can't participate. Yes, you can. There are a myriad of ways in which you can. All of us can be involved in teaching kids' classes. All of us can be involved in, in making sure that we uh, are, are writing maybe cars to people who are sick. Uh, I know several of our ladies are involved in sending thank you cars to visitors. These are all ways that we can be part of the work. Even if, and it's, it's not necessarily important that other people know that we are. There's a lot that happens here that I happen to hear about that no one else knows. I know that for a fact. There are some things that are done anonymously that no one else knows about. And that's, that's fine. That's, that's, that's great. The end result is, guess who does know about it? God does. And really, in the end, he's the one that matters. Another brother's edified. Another sister's encouraged. God is given praise. It doesn't have to be public knowledge. Be straightforward with yourself concerning strengths and weaknesses. You know, all of us have certain abilities that maybe are, are different than someone else's. And we have those in varying degrees. That's okay. That doesn't mean that one person is better than you or that you're better than someone else. That's no different than what the Corinthians were doing in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, arguing about the spiritual gifts, thinking that I'm better than someone else. No, we all have roles that we can provide 
based on our abilities. But we need to make sure we're honest with ourselves as to what those abilities are and then utilize them. Don't just think you have nothing. I guarantee you, nobody here has nothing. Some of us have, are given seven talents, some are given five, some are given maybe two. But you know what? The master still held that servant accountable who had the two talents and didn't do anything with them. And of course, in that context, talents was money, not talent as an ability. Just happy coincidence. Make specific effort regarding plans to reach those on, outside, uh, on the outside to encourage other Christians as well. Our gospel meeting, for instance, that's one of those specifically planned, specific efforts to try to bring to encouragement, edification to our brethren, but also to invite friends and neighbors. It's important to take advantage of those opportunities. And it's important for us as a group of God's people to make efforts like that. Not just general thoughts, you know, hey, we really need to do better at this. Let's talk about specific things that we can do. And let's plan for those types of things, whether it's as a congregation of God's people or as individuals. I'll leave you with this last final thought this, this morning. The lesson will be yours. Some decades ago, John F. Kennedy made the statement, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Well, I'm going to steal that statement of his and adapt it a little bit because I think it fits just as well with our lesson. Ask not what the body can do for you, what faith can do for you, what the church can do for you, but what you can do for the body, what you can do for the church, what you can do for the faith in Christ Jesus. Again, will we be benefited in that process because others are seeking to help us? Yeah, but this isn't just about me and what I can get out of it. This is about as just as much what I can put into it. You know, there's that phrase, and it's pretty much true in almost every aspect of life. You get in, or you get out of it as much as you put into it. Okay, I can vouch. That's true of college. Okay, I learned that on the, end, the, the negative end of it. <laughs> and that's true in the spiritual realm as well. You will get out of it what you put into it. If we apply ourselves and are fervent in spirit and we're seeking to help others, guess what? We will be helped in return. We will reap what we sow. So we need to pay attention this morning to what we're sowing. Are we sowing of the spirit or of the flesh? Are we sowing only for ourselves or are we sowing for others? That's the lesson for you this morning. I hope it's something beneficial for us to consider as we consider our responsibilities in the body of Christ as a whole, but specifically here at this location in Wichita Falls, to know that we're not just bumps on a log, and we don't have to be bumps on a log, that our responsibility is to actually be active in the work here. We offer the invitation this morning to those who are not Christians to be baptized, to have your sins washed away, to be added to a body of Christ that cares about you, but also that needs you to help it. People, brethren, and brothers and sisters in Christ who care as much about you and hopefully that you will care just as much about them so that you will help one another so that together you get to heaven because we can't make it on our own. It's impossible to make it on our own. That's why God gave us the church. That's why he had his son die for us. That's why Jesus was willing to, to give his blood to purchase the body of Christ so that there would be a vehicle for the saved to get to heaven, and that is the church. For those of us who are Christians, let's remind ourselves of what our responsibility is as part of a local work. Let's remind ourselves of the need to put into practice the things that we hear and the things that we know and make sure we're always seeking to do good works. Good works that will benefit not just me, but most especially will benefit those around me, whether they are not Christians or maybe they are works that are designed to raise the spiritual awareness of others. That's what good works are. They are actions, words, deeds that are designed to raise the spiritual awareness of others. And then let God take over. You plant the seed, let God provide the increase. The lesson is yours. If you're subject, please come forward as we stand and sing.